Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Uganda. <clears throat> My name is Richard Kamia, aka African Thinker. We welcome you all to the Red Friday, the platform where we discuss hot topics throughout the week happening in our country, Uganda. On the panel today, I have a few smart gentlemen and a, a lady. I have Dr. Kauma by me. I have JK. I have John Julius, have Madame Agnes, and all these gentlemen here, are, gentlemen here, are going to discuss with us all the hardy topics that are happening in uh, in Uganda. <laughs> A lot has been going on in the past week, and the, uh, around the country, lots of things have gone on. We've seen the NUP leadership visiting the Electoral Commission to inform them of the uh, our uh, the principles they knew leader of the party. We've seen uh, the NUP leadership bringing out the, the, the police brutality to the Electoral Commission. We've also seen the president come up, speak about the Arua saga. A lot has been going on. On my panel today, the smart gentleman and the lady with me here are ready to talk on, to take on the task today. Gentlemen, you are welcome to the Red Friday. And I will ask you to introduce yourselves within two seconds of each. Dr. Kauma, I'll start with you. Uh, hello, viewers. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name uh, is Daniel Kauma. I'm based here uh, near the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. I thank you again for tuning in, and uh, I look forward to sharing ideas with the rest of the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kauma. Comrade J.K., carry on. Yeah, greetings to all the viewers who are watching this program, wherever you are. Thank you so much for watching. We look forward to having a good discussion. Comrade Agnes, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. I have that, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is um, Agnes. I am based in Massachusetts, USA. I am a lawyer here. I'm also a legal advisor to People Power or, or NUP um, in the Boston chapter. Thank you. I am looking forward to having this discussion. We're happy to have you on the panel today. Uh, Comrade John Julius. Please introduce yourself in a few seconds. Comrade John Julius, unmute yourself. Oh, okay. I guess uh, he's going to sort out his uh, speaker. I think he can't hear us, Comrade John Julius, but we can see you. Okay. <clears throat> As I've mentioned above, a lot has been going on in the country, and we'll kick off with what has been happening of recent. Recently, we saw the principal in Mbale suing the state on having been blocked from attending a radio station in that area. We saw the magistrate playing ping pong, rejecting the, uh, postponing the case indefinitely, while within a few hours, there was another case that he took on in the same court. Comrade, uh, Dan Kauma, what is your take on that? Uh, thank you so much uh, for that important question. And I think um, with the roadmap we have of the scientific election in Uganda today, this is uh, a very critical topic. And I want to look at it uh, from two angles. Uh, the first angle is why is NRM government and Museveni doing what they are doing in terms of suffocating the opposition in terms of accessing media as we saw happen in bali that's the first question i want to address and and secondly i want to think about i want us to think about if this is a good strategic move for nup to challenge what the law enforcement is doing in the courts now if you look at the first question um whenever you run for president in uganda as honorable chagulani is doing uh, you are not only challenging yoweri kaguta museveni you are challenging the state. Uh, so what NRM does, they weaponize every institution and organ in Uganda 
Uh, for instance, the Ministry of Health has been weaponized. Though we had a pandemic where they launched guidelines through the Public Health Act, they use those guidelines to target the majority of the opposition. So NRM has weaponized the Ministry of Health. Uh, if you look at the Electoral Commission, it's been weaponized already. Uh, not only did Museveni dismiss eight members of the Electoral Commission, but they have also influenced the election guidelines by changing it halfway down the road. Uh, if you look at the police, the police is being used to target majority of opposition. If you look at parliament, they're using parliament not only to pass supplementary budgets, which are funding what NRM is doing on the ground at the moment, uh, but they're also willing to pass any laws that need to be done, like extending the presidential age limits. So every aspect of NRM government and our country has been weaponized to challenge any opposition leaders. And Honorable Chagolani at the moment is facing challenges from not only Museveni, but the state. So when you look at the issue of, our, of, of Mbali at the moment, it brings to the forefront not only the judiciary, but law enforcement. Now, why is Museveni doing what they're doing? NRM does not want to have a principled argument in the coming election. They don't want to discuss policy. Because they know if you talk about the economy, Ugandans are going to remember that 40% of the youth are unemployed. They know that if you're going to discuss economic opportunities in Uganda today, we have 1.5 million Ugandans living abroad or seeking opportunities abroad since Museveni took power. So we don't have economic opportunities to fund, to, to employ all Ugandans at the moment. They don't want to have an argument about the healthcare system in Uganda because at the moment we are losing 400 Ugandans to malaria each and every day. If you look at our public hospitals like Mulago Hospital, the government is funding each Ugandan who goes to a public hospital 3,000 shillings per month. Think about it, 3,000 shillings. So NRM does not want to have an argument about the economy. They don't want to have an argument about what's happening to the healthcare system in Uganda today, especially the way they have weaponized COVID-19. And they also don't want to have any argument about our institutions such as agriculture, agriculture sector, where we fund, we are the second least funded agriculture sector in Africa today, yet we're supposed to be the breadbasket uh, of Africa. So NRM wants to focus on distractions. And the Mbale saga is a distraction. Uh, if you look at the other distractions we have had, first they challenged the barrette. They said you cannot wear the barrette legally. Then they challenged the red color. They said it belonged to UPC. After that, they challenged NUP. They said it was acquired illegally. Now they are promoting the Mavirizi story. And every day there's something which they are throwing to the opposition. So they want the opposition to be occupied by all these distractions so that mm -hmm. you spend all your time and resources instead of focusing on Museveni and challenging what the government has done in the last 34 years. They want the opposition to be carried away, uh, bailing out young people who are arrested every day, uh, going to court to challenge all the issues happening right now at the moment. So that's the reason why they are doing what they're doing in, in Bali. Now, is it the right strategy to challenge it, to challenge them in court? And I think it's very crucial mm -hmm. for France. One, it's important to set a president if our judiciary is going to uphold the law. So if we don't challenge what's happening in Uganda in court, the world doesn't get to see that even the judiciary has been compromised. And at the moment, it's very clear that judiciary has been compromised because two days ago when Honorable Chagulani went to court, the chief magistrate adjourned the session to an undisclosed date. So right now we don't know when the court is even going to be brought to, before the jury because they are trying to protect the government. They are protecting law enforcement, which Honorable Chagwan wanted to hold accountable. But it's very important to hold the precedent yeah. that we're going to use the institutions of government to challenge what's happening on the ground. Uh, another point is it's good to send a message to security operatives because right now there's a saying in Uganda that everyone is operating on orders from above. So it's important to set a precedent that when security agencies are torturing Ugandans, when they are violating human rights, they are going to be held individually accountable. So it sets a good precedent. So we start building a case against individuals that are torturing Ugandans, that are killing Ugandans, that are violating the civil liberties of Ugandans on the streets today. So that's what this case does in Bali. First, by testing whether the judiciary 
is actually going to uphold the law. And secondly, we need to start building a case to violators of human rights. We saw what the U.S. State Department did last year, where they they did they put sanctions on Kaihura, and they froze all his assets in the United States. So building such cases is holding the culprits responsible, especially as we go deeper into the elections, we're going to see more and more of harassment of the opposition by the NRM government and by security agencies. So much as I argue that the case in Bali is a destruction, like many destructions we have had, and I hope NUP can start sheltering Honorable Chagulani so he doesn't spend a lot of time extinguishing these small fires they are creating. So he focuses on the campaign, so he focuses on his message of liberating Uganda. So he focuses on, on challenging Museveni on substantial issues such as a failed economy, a failed healthcare system, and abuse of civil rights and liberties of the Ugandan people. So I, I think it's a very crucial case that we go ahead in Bali and expose what the government is doing today. So thank you so much for that question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Daniel Kauma. <clears throat> You've mentioned a lot about how uh, the honorable is being uh, suffocated. You've mentioned how he's being diverted to petty issues so he can avoid the major cause of uh, chasing after change in the country. And that brings us uh, to our next uh, question that we, uh, we have to deal with. Comrade JK. Yeah. After paying attention to what Dr. Daniel Kaum has just mentioned, you've had all the points that he's brought out about how the junta is trying to suffocate the honorable. How do you think has the NRM and Museven in partic particular suffocated the UCC, which happens to be the regulator of the media in Uganda and many other media houses in Uganda to prolong his stay in power? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, comrade Kamia. Uh, the biggest problem that we have in Uganda is lack of respect to human rights. Because this has been happening since Museven rose to power in, in 86, 1986, and it's been continuous because he's not questioned in any way. And the biggest people that are supposed to display what the wrongs that the regime is doing and Mr. Museveni is the media. But Mr. Museveni has successfully intimidated these media houses. He has bought chairs in these media houses and they are failing to speak out the facts because about half of the media that broadcast in Uganda, both the mainstream and the, and the paper media is, is, is being controlled by those who have bought shares and they have stolen taxpayers' money to buy these shares from these media companies. So they play a big role in what we receive as public. Mr. Seven also has planted spies in these in this, in this newsrooms everywhere, all over the country. Most of the newsrooms have, have spies. People, people don't, don't report accurately because they feel they are, they are not so safe with their comrades because of the way they have been disappearing on different occasions. They, they, they kidnap journalists, like how Samson Kasumba was kidnapped late in the night when leaving the show. So these things escalate fear in them not to report accurately. Then there is, there is something that they have prominently brought up forward, the brown envelope uh, journalism. They are giving money to all these people to sort of to, to send off some stories, like the story of the of the stealing from the sick, the one uh, Seranja did. They tried to to suffocate this so that it doesn't come out to the public. Uh, uh, thank you so much. But uh, as I leave this 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 question, comrade, I urge all the media in Uganda, because history will speak about. They are bad, bad things that they are trying to, to sit on, not to air out the people. History, how will history judge you as the media owner in Uganda? How will you go to the history books as time comes when, when the right democracy comes in, into our country? Mind about the people, mind about the future of the country, because it's where your kids are going to be growing in. So if you bring fear into the media and they don't report the right things that are happening, Ugandans cannot see what's coming ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Comrade JK. Uh, what I can tell from what you said is that most of these people that are running these media houses are the oligarchs, are people that are around the big men, are people that are uh, in the same circle with the, with the junta in power. 
and those that are out are being completely suffocated and intimidated so that people don't get accurate news <clears throat> which is which we can understand because this has been ongoing for quite some time dr daniel kauma when you listen to something like that that brings us to something that has when we talk about oligarchs and people being intimidated that brings us to an incident in arua i guess that you have been in the diaspora for quite some time now. And when I mention the word Arua, I'm sure it echoes in your ears and there is a lot that you memorize. There is a lot that comes to your mind when we speak about Arua. Dr. Daniel, we saw the SFC in Arua. We saw the SFC in parliament. We saw the SFC at uh, Honorable uh, Chazes, uh, uh, Zake's house in Mitiana recently when he was brutalized. Now, uh, Dr. Daniel Kauman, when you pay attention recently to what the president has been able to say to the media while he addressing police graduates recently, where he comes in and says he's very satisfied with how the SFC treated Honorable Chagulani, what does this say about the man raising the SFC that has been at the center of brutalizing Ugandans to an extent that the, the current principal of the NUP nearly got killed by these same security forces. What does that say about this man? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that question. But I also want to add uh, a few points to the question about the media. Because it's a very important question. Because uh, we have to think about why we have the scientific roadmap in the first place. There's a reason why Museveni did not want to campaign head to head with Bobby Wine, because Bobby Wine is a great mobilizer. Bobby Wine is a great campaigner. So the reason why they diverted the campaign guidelines to make it only scientific per se, uh, because we are, they're only campaigning on media outlets, they wanted to neutralize Honorable Chagulani's strength, which is mobilizing voters. So that's the reason why we don't have, it's not just because of COVID-19, because actually they had the possibility of postponing the elections by calling for a state of emergency, but they did not do that because they wanted to limit Honorable Chagulani to campaigning on media outlets, which they control, like my co-panelist stated. Uh, if you look at the state of media today, Uganda is ranked 125th out of 180 in the world today in press freedom. So we don't have a free and fair press in Uganda today. Um, and recently, just an example, uh, you saw the SEC elections in Uganda today. They were broadcast live on all national, national, national uh, media outlets, live. And these are internal NRM elections. We are broadcast to the nation. So if you look at 80% of the coverage since the election roadmap was rolled out, 80% of the coverage has been going towards NRM and the opposition, if you look at the stories the opposition has been getting in the media, they have been mostly uh, defaming Honorable Chagulanyi by elevating the likes of Mavirizi and all the other people who are sowing division within NUP. So NRM is playing a strategic game because they know they control the media, like my co panelist mentioned, through the UCC. UCC is a regulatory body they are using to threaten media outlets by telling them they are going to revoke their licenses. So if you host a member of opposition who criticizes the government, they threaten NTV or NBS that they're going to revoke their licenses using, and maybe our legal panelists can, can educate us on this, they launched the Uganda Communications Act in 2013. And, and this law has been used like we had the Public Order Management Act. They have used this law to target media outlets by saying that, by criminalizing speech, so they are saying, like, if you go on media outlets and you distort facts, or you incite public violence, or you incite public security, or you engage in cyberbullying that we saw with Stella Nyanzi, they are going to lock you up, or they are going to revoke your license. So Museveni is using UCC, and they are using the Communications Act of 2013 to suffocate the media. Those are the two main channels, and I wanted to highlight that point, that they are strategically using the UCC and uh, the Communications Act of 2013 to suffocate the media. So I just wanted to highlight those two points. Okay, now, yes. a question about the, uh, 
the Arua saga. Yes. Um, it's, it's very disheartening um, listening to Museveni. This is a group of cadets who are just graduating. It's law enforcement going out to serve the Ugandan people. So Museveni is telling them that what happened in Arua was self-defense, that the torture that happened in Rua was self-defense. That's pretty much the argument he was making. So what yeah. message are you sending to law enforcement that torture is justifiable? Honorable Chagulani was tortured in Arua. So what message are you sending that you can go out as police and torture Ugandans? What message are you saying? We had Yasin Kauma was murdered in Arua. So you are saying it's acceptable for law enforcement to go and kill Ugandans? They planted evidence in the hotel room of Honorable Chagulani. So if you look at the events that played out in Arua and the message the president is sending to these new police graduates that it's acceptable, he called it self-defense. It's acceptable to go and torture someone. It's acceptable to kill someone like Yasin Kauma in this case. That it's acceptable to plant evidence in the hotel room. To this day, we don't even know what happened to that case. They came and planted guns in Honorable Chagulani's hotel room. But to this day, we don't know what happened to that case. And they charged him for treason. So the message coming from Museveni, and people need to pay attention, he has been talking about crushing his detractors. So the message Museveni is sending that this police, especially in this election period, I talked about activating every branch of government to make sure they retain power. They are trying to send a message to police officers like the ones in Bali who blocked Honorable Chagwani from going to the radio station that their job is to crush the opposition. And the last point I want to make is that Museveni is not saying these words just... He has a reason for saying what he does. Uh, Bobby Wine's rising to fame was after what happened in Arua. Before he was a popular member of parliament, but after he was tortured in Arua, he was able to rise above being a member of parliament to the leader of the opposition. Because people started respecting Honorable Chagulani after that. They said he's a tough, he's a tough fella, he's committed to the opposition, and he's willing to withstand everything that NRM is going to throw at him. So Arua was a very pivotal moment in the life, in the political life of Honorable Chagulani. So by Museveni coming out to make those statements, he wants to diminish what happened in Arua so that Bobby Wine is not viewed the way he is in the opposition as someone who has gone through, as we call it, the baptism by fire. So it wasn't a coincidence that Museveni said those words. He's strategically trying to cut down on Bobby Wine's appeal among the masses, that he's their hero, their fighter, that he's willing to take on the regime, that is willing to even deploy the police to fight him. So I think that's what Arua means uh, for the opposition, and that's why Museveni made those comments, which were unfortunate. And he sends the wrong message to the rest of law enforcement in Uganda, that they can continue violating the rights of Ugandans. They went to Makerere and raped students. We have seen them either kill people on the street, shooting live bullets. And people always ask the question, why is the police lawless? And now we know why, because the message is coming from the top. So it's unfortunate, and that's why Ugandans need change. That's why we need a civilian in the state house, because a civilian is going to look at solving Uganda's problems, not by using the military, not by using police, but mobilizing Ugandans to develop their country, to fight for injustice, and making sure there is opportunity for everyone. Thank you so much for that question. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniel Koma. You have really illustrated how the, the dictator is using his power <clears throat> to be able to suppress everything that the, the, the Enoop and people power are trying to do, to be able to convince the security forces like they belong to himself, trying to ridicule everything that is going on in the country and uttering statements that are basically disrespecting the law, democracy, and making the police forces think that they can do as the president says. Thank you so much for that. And that brings us to, to something different. It's not necessarily different, but something that speaks about our female counterparts in the struggle and women in Uganda in general. Comrade JK, we have seen lots of women faces 
in the NRM regime, we have seen so many women from the Seventeen Days to the Kadagas to the uh, Speciosa Kaziwe, so many women in the NRM regime. Uh, doc, like Dr. Cheng, the Minister of Health, and so many others, as you know. Comrade JK, how do you think has the NRM and M7 in particular disrespected the women of Uganda and the women, specifically the women in the NRM government, to overstay in power? We are, uh, before you carry on that, that question, I want to be able to say to you that we have got a lot of women that are working for this movement. But from the past 35 years and from the experience that you have, how has this regime been able to disrespect women in particular and women in the NRM government to overstay in power? Yeah, thank you so much, Comrade Kamia. Uh, that's a very beautiful question. Uh, because in the, in, the past, in the past regimes, women were not put on the forefront. Women were, were said that they're supposed to be cooking, they're supposed to be behind, behind uh, the, the, the front line. So what Mr. Seven did, he brought this rhetoric that women are supposed to be on the forefront. And unknowing that he's gonna be manipulating them. Fine, we have very intelligent people, and very intelligent women in Uganda, but Museven ends up manipulating them. You know, in a dictatorship, uh, whenever the dictators age and get to that stage, they feel they should be surround, surrounding themselves with women to, to be safe. That's how you see that uh, he, has, he has Evelyn Anite, who strongly comes out in front of the media, and she says that we have the Maje, whoever comes out, we shall crush them. So, so these women feel privileged that in the previous regimes, they did not have that chance to come out to speak out. So they feel this is the opportunity and this is their time. And he ends up using them and doing mistakes in their statements and also signing different documents which are, which are not right and passing different laws. Uh, we've seen so many people like, so many women like Special Zawande Rakazibwe, himself the president, when he appointed Special Zawande Rakazibwe, one day he was quoted saying, that I've just appointed this woman, th this lady here, Speciosa, to make the Basoga feel good. So the main purpose of him appointing Speciosa was not to make, was not to make her and put her brain at work, but only pleasing the Basoga, because by that time it was only Chirunda Chibajina who was in government. So he wanted also to give them a big position to feel they're not left out. Uh, also, Mr. Seven has violated and he manipulated women to keep himself in power. The best example is uh, Rebecca Kadaga. She passed this, 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 uh, she passed this age, uh, age limit because she was uh, in, in, in connivance with the dictator. In the first, she wrote a letter to Mr. Museveni asking how he let the, the SFC enter parliament. But in the recent past, when she was hosted on a TV show, she clearly showed that she was behind everything that transpired in parliament, including beating up of members and uh, mm. member, a member of parliament by the names of Nambo, the Betty teacher. She was, uh, the, the, she was, her back was broken in the process. And yes. Kadag, according to the statement, Kadaga really justified that she's the one who, who sh she knew everything about the SFC attacking the, the, the flow of parliament and beating out members, manhandling them in on all bad sorts of manner. She was quoted saying that if it wasn't her, Mr. M7 would be packing his things going back to Rajtura. This clearly showing that the letter she wrote to M7 inquiring about that the, the letter she wrote to M7 inquiring about his uh, his uh, his his allowing the SFC to come to parliament was just a mockery to Ugandan. It was just blinding, blindfolding Ugandans because she knew everything that was going to happen. To the fact that even the special forces passed through her door that uses to get into the, the, the office, in our chambers in the office, it was really disheartening, it was really very bad that she knew everything. And all these things were, are going to be attributed to Rebecca Kadaga because of the way she was manipulated. She felt like she has all the powers. 
but Annie knowing she's controlling a, a Uganda that has a future of 44 million Ugandans who are looking forward to a good Uganda. So Museven is being seen right now appointing people like Hajat Kanike, Betty Kamia, Irene Moloni, Catherine Kosasira. Imagine President Museven to his level and the time he has been in power, appointing Catherine Kosasira, who cannot even spell the word advisor, who cannot spell the word presidential. It's really very bad for a country like Uganda, who has got very learned people who cannot be deployed to do government jobs, but bringing up mediocres to think for people. Dr. Jen Ruth Alkeng, Dr. Uh, Ruth Nankaviruan, Janat Mukwaya, this woman has been serving since from the old regimes of, of, of Apollo Milton Obote, and the right now is bringing them because they can endorse everything that the dictator says. We know very well that whenever these dictators are, are near living power, they, they tend to, to not trust men. Because if you look at Kanumar Gaddafi, even the people the, the people who were surrounding his, uh, his security were mostly women because he knew that he cannot trust men at the time he was, he was aging and he has overstayed in power. They can't trust any man to be around them. And these women end up being messed and signing documents that they are not even aware, of, but because they're acting on orders of the junta. Thank you so much, comrade. Thank you so much, comrade JK, for, for giving out such a uh, good ideologies on how the dictator has disrespected our women from way back i can tell from what you say that from way back we had people like dr spacios akaziwe who ended up in a dumb scandal lots of money lost there now recently we have doctor we have uh, uh the speaker madame kadaga boasting about being the one responsible and the one for the, the engine behind the, the, the dictator still being in power on a TV station. And these are mothers and these are leaders in society. And the dictator basically is using these people to completely touch their names in society. Because now look what uh, we have seen uh, uh, Kadaga do. The constitution has been completely disrespected. Who is behind it? Kadaga thousands millions of shillings got lost in the uh, in the dumb scandal who was behind it dr speciosa kazibwe now we have dr Acheng. uh lots of money that was donated to covid is nowhere to be seen who is leading this dr Acheng. so you are basically saying that the president is being so is is tarnishing these women's images in society Yet these people could have been very, 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 very influential and good citizens to a country like Uganda. Thank you so much for that uh, great analysis. And that brings us to a follow-up. Question to Comrade Agedi, PUP. Comrade Agnes, how has the NU leadership so far been different from the current NRM regime when it comes to women? Please take it on from there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so um, to show the distinction, I would have to, to point out some of the things that the NRM has been doing um, with the women. The NRM is a, a regime um, or um, or a government that has been based on uh, rewarding. Um, it's um, the fighters or the rebels that um, overtook power in 1986 in Uganda. So um, if you look at most of the people who fought in the um, guerrilla war, um, those were men. So the NRM came in power with, with uh, a group of men and ha the government has been uh, formed in on, on the basis of rewarding those men with uh, different uh, ministries or different uh, sectors where they can um, recoup a lot of money and steal money from the, the Ugandan people. So where, that, um, where I'm taking this is that, that the NRM as a government has very little room for women based on the fact that the people who fought and took over power were mostly men. So when you look at the formation of the NRM government, it's formed by men. And every time there is a, a woman 
in, in the NRM government, uh, that woman can, can be traced. Most of the time, that woman can be traced to, to some origin in connection, whether directly or indirectly, to, um, to the guerrilla war um, that captured power in Uganda in 1986. Um, so the NRM has brought in very little in terms of diversity, in terms of gender diversity. Um, and every woman who has come in from the outside um, to, to enter government in the NRM regime, during the NRM regime has been humiliated um, in the end because the NRM uses, or rather on seven uses, those women as puppets to, to do his dirty work. He does not respect them as, as colleagues, as, as he should. Um, we have seen very uh, brilliant women uh, naming um, Sebastian Day. She was a brilliant woman. She came to um, take away corruption from the country. She did a lot of good work. And Museveni used that very intelligent woman to do his dirty work. And he started uh, using her to, to, do, to um, do his bits. And she got humiliated that she had to leave the country. We, we can look at um, Jennifer Mosesi of, of most recent. Um, he brought Jennifer Mosesi. She's a brilliant woman. She's very smart and capable as a woman, just like, um, and when she brought, when he brought her into, into Kampala City Council to clean up the city, she was capable of doing it, but he controlled and micromanaged her to a way that she could not use her brain and think um, and apply her skills and her intelligence to, to better the country, but rather Museveni used her to um to oppress ugandans and to oppress people who were um in the town standing up and rising up against um against the regime in chiseka in the chiseka market or in the other areas and so jennifer was had to also leave the country because again she, they create a lot of enemies in the process of working for the government that does not respect them as colleagues but rather as puppets that are put in the government to 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 do the the dirty work um when you look at um the the way that the nrm is women is, is almost in a way that they're subservient or they're inferior or in a way that they're there to to they're there to to do the the men's work or to do the work for the men and command um the men meaning the, the men in the nrm and seven in particular to do the work as told and not to apply their skills and their education and their intelligence to better the country. Um, when we look at things like that, and uh, there is a lot, of, there is a long list of women who have um, gone through that kind of, um, of thing with the regime. When we look at, uh, when we compare that with people power and um, uh, most recently NUP, we can see that um, that the NUP is bringing up women and offering them positions of leadership, letting them sit on the table and speak freely and not sub, um, subduing them or putting them in positions of inferiority or um, or making them feel unwelcome to to participate or to be. If you look at a lot of um, a lot of positions in the NUP leadership, there's a lot. There are a lot of women. Um, and besides what NUP has already done, if you look at the programs, um, we, are, we are yet to, to um, roll out the, the entire manifesto and, um, and policies that we, we are working on. But uh, if you look at the policies that we have, these are policies that are aimed at respecting girls and women um, the same way that men and boys are respected. Um, and so, you know, these are things that there is a lot that has been done by the regime. 25 years um, in power has caused a lot of damage um, to girls from when they are in school. Um, one of the examples is um, by adding a point to a girl. When when children are rolling out of uh, getting out of high school to go to, to um, the university, a girl gets an extra point um, than a boy. Um, and that, in a way, is creating um, a mentality among girls and boys, little girls, and as well as boys that that are colleagues, that the girls are otherwise not capable of achieving. The girls are not uh, your equal. The girls need more 
more help or more uplifting or we need to abet them to get more pressure and remind them. And that has created um, um, inequality in schools, in the workplace, where um, in promotions, in the corporate world in Uganda, the women are not treated as equals. They're not, it has cascaded from the public sector to the private sector that the women are not really treated as equals. And that is damage that has been done by the NRM from when children are younger or when people are dealing with each other. That in the corporate world right now, women um, women are hired, but it's very hard to find them rising and, and achieving their potential and, um, and leading corporations or leading companies or taking up um, big roles as they are supposed to because they have been um, conditioned to think they're, they're not as capable or they're not as good. And the boys who are their colleagues have been um, conditioned to think the same way. So when you fight, when you look at it, it has gone everywhere. And that is all work that the NEP has to, to take up and clean up. And it's going to take time, but we are definitely on it. Um, and uh, we, we definitely can do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Comrade Agnes, for that great input. It's so good to hear a lady speak about how the regime has been able to abuse our women and how the NUP is really doing its best to be able to, to stand up with the women, to show love to the women, to be able to make women realize their dreams, achieve their full potential. And I think that is the kind of leadership we need. That's the kind of government we're looking for. Just recently, you've seen the principal celebrating his anniversary with his wife for 19 years. He said he's loved her the same. We need a president that has that heart, the love for women, the respect for women. If for 19 years we've had a 38-year-old man loving his woman unconditionally, then you surely can rely on such a man to say, our women will be safe. Thank you so much. And that brings us to our next uh, discussion. And here we are going to talk about the grease, the, 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 the lubricant that runs the struggle, and that is the money. Just recently, just this week, we saw the principal unveiling uh, uh, the fundraising campaign for the movement as we head uh, towards the elections. We have seen the slogans of Modaku Muda, which is that which is in shilling. We see a lot of fundraisings in the diaspora. We have seen... Uh, uh, Many people donating to the People Power website and the number that gets this, that is the names of Daniel we wrote. We've seen all this happening. Comrade Abiri, what do you think of the fact that this week, the principal and the NUP leadership have started to launch fundraising, which is happening all over the world? Please take us through what you think is, how good this is going to be for the movement, how you think how well you think the diaspora is doing when it comes to this fundraising and for what good you think this is please take us through that briefly uh thank you comrade uh african thinker and thank you fellow panelists i'm glad to be in this show with you uh first of all uh in today's politics finances are very fundamental uh, I yes. speak this uh, with more authority. I am an accountant by profession. Uh, if you look at the politics of Uganda, the politics of Uganda, uh, despite the fact that uh, politics is run by finances, it has also been abused financially. In other words, uh, the regime uses uh, national resources, uh, to run its political campaigns. And more so, they make the situation worse by even bribing voters. Now, that gives us, as we as NUP, that gives us a very steep hill to, cut, to, uh, to run. So that's why it's very critical for us uh, to fundraise. Now, why is NUP fundraising funds for elections? We are not fundraising funds, first of all, uh, to bribe anyone. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I, these campaigns are run by finances. Uh, we need to get our candidates on radio stations uh, to talk to the people. We need our candidates to traverse the country. We need our candidates to be advertised in different media 
outlets, and all this requires finances. We have the state arresting our comrades uh, just because they are NUP uh, to, to intimidate them. So we need finances to help them legally to, to get out of jails and all sorts of funny charges that have been incremented on them. So that will, that being said, uh, the principal uh, who is Honorable Robert Chaglani, our next president, uh, launched uh, a massive fundraising campaign uh, recently. The aim is to fulfill those obligations that I mentioned. And so in this regard, uh, we as the diaspora, we are very fundamental in this role. We have a big role to play. So, for example, in Texas, uh, sorry, for example, in the US, we agreed that we are going to buy each card at $50 or more. It's not that because uh, the, the, the diaspora has a lot of money to splash around, but that is how important we view this struggle. And also, uh, we, other countries, uh, other continents like Australia, Europe, uh, you go to Asia, all these other continents and countries are also playing the same role. Reason being that uh, Robert Chaglani and the NUP do not have the capacity to match uh, the state-run elections of UN Kagutam 7. Uh, first of all, even if we were to fundraise the funds from internally from Uganda, there's a lot of intimidation, there's a lot of bribery, any wealthy person or any well-to-do person that comes up to support Robert Chaglani, uh, their businesses are suffo suffocated. And so because of such intimidations, uh, it's hard for Robert Chaglani to fundraise the funds internally. So this is where the diaspora is very critical. And my humble plea to all NUP members in the diaspora, please let's fundraise for these elections. Mm -hmm. We know it's frustrating. Uh, even we know that the funds that we are going to raise will not match the one of you and Kagutam 7 because he's using taxpayers' money while we are so fundraising this money, also listing it uh, legally and morally. Mm -hmm. So I urge us uh, to go out and fundraise. And we don't have to even fundraise only within NUP. We need to talk to well-wishers of democracy. Because at the end of the day, a good Uganda, a, a, a stable Uganda is a stable world. We are in a global village. What happens in one country affects people in the other country. Just like today in the US, uh, we have the Black Lives Matter. Uh, in DC, uh, where Comrade Dr. Kauma is, uh, there's a big demonstration taking place right now. And I believe that even people in Africa are interested in that, the outcome or the resolutions that will come out of that uh, demonstration. So we live in a global village, and therefore, it's when we are looking for funds for this campaign, let's not only reach out to Ugandans, Let's not only reach out to NUP people, we need to explain to them uh, the dangers that the dictatorship in Uganda poses to Africa and to the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar Dabiri, on that uh, uh, great input on the fundraising. And we've seen a lot happening in the diaspora, seen a lot of barbecues in different countries, fundraising for the movement. We've seen people urging people not to pay only the minimum number price of price on the cards to pay even more, to, so we can be able to raise more and more money on this. And Comrade Agnes, as a Ugandan, why would you think that an ordinary Ugandan should donate to this cause? Do you think this is the last chance for any Ugandan to see change in the country? Because we know that through fundraising, there is a lot that we can achieve. Through the donations, there is a lot that we can achieve. As a Ugandan, why would you encourage an 
an ordinary Ugandan to donate to this cause, Comrade Agnes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for uh, for channeling me. And um, I urge Ugandans to to uh, be part of this um, this movement and this journey, this revolution, because this is our country. And um, the NRM government took over power. The the guerrilla war that they conducted in 1986 was um, done by support from um, from some Ugandans, uh, some of the wealthy Ugandans contributed a lot of money, a lot of resources to the to the guerrilla war, um, and um, some foreigners contributed a lot of funds to to the to the war, and that's how they took power. Um, and um, since they took power, there have been a lot of funds poured in from around the world, from different different governments and different um, interest groups that have, that are pushing different policies and different um, the country to go in a different direction that they want it to be. Now, when you look at that, that's not the direction where Ugandans want it to be. So, if Ugandans, this is a chance where Ugandans um, should um, should shape their country. This is a time when Ugandans should not let Americans or or the English or the Canadians or the Swedes um, to to detect or to predict uh, what their country should look like. This is a time when Ugandans who have one shill one hundred shillings or one thousand or whatever the case to to offer that so that their country is not stolen just like the previous government has done. When uh, when anyone gives you money, they're expecting something in return. That is um that is done in the U.S. government, in you know, and, and then around the world, when someone is donating money to a campaign, they're expecting something. They're going to push certain policies, and those policies that are policies that are impoverishing uh, Ugandans and Africans. But um in this particular case, Ugandans. If we do not come out right now and offer the little we have together, we need a lot of money, but we can raise it because we are many. Um, we are, we have Ugandans around the world. We have Ugandans back home. And um, knowing that everyone can bring the same amount, but whatever little you have, uh, you should bring it forth as a Ugandan because you are get, becoming part of, of deciding what your country should look like. If we let foreign government or foreign leaders or foreign agencies or whatever interest groups are out there to pour money into our campaign, we are selling our country once again, just like it was done uh, 35 years ago. We do not want that. So um, I call upon Ugandans to, to come and be part of this, to be part of this change, so that when we, um, when we take power and are deciding what Uganda should look like, we do not have people whispering in our ears of our heads saying, I gave you my money, I expect this to be done this way. Um, and um, so that is a responsibility of every Ugandan. Once again, not everyone has the same amount of money, but we all can be part of this by bringing uh, whatever little we have. Um, so this is a responsibility of every Ugandan to say it so that we are keeping or taking ownership back or taking ownership back of our country and our destiny and what kind of country we want to, to live for our next generations because that is definitely not what has been going on. The policies that are passed um, in Uganda are not uh, favorable to Ugandans and now uh, we can see that, the, that we are being spoken for by the government in power but also by foreign governments who are funding it. So we our hands are tied and that is something that we do not want going into the future. That is something that we need to change now. And this kind of revolution should be a people's revolution involving people's energies and their um, and their funds and uh, whatever little they can contribute. But we need to buy back our dignity and our respect as Ugandans, as Africans, as people, so that we don't have to, to be spoken for going forward another generation and another one after that. Um, now, that being spoken, we do um, fundraise a lot. I am based in Massachusetts. We do have, I'm going to make an announcement that is uncalled for, I didn't pay for this one, but we do have, uh, <laughs> we do it's have fine. fundraisers. Uh, there is one that I'm actually, uh, we, in Massachusetts, our leader here is called Dorothy. Um, she's our chapter leader. 
Um, and uh, we're together as a chapter, we are organizing different fundraising um, campaigns. And one of them, we have a, an, a Zoom fundraising campaign this coming Sunday. We have it every other Sunday. Uh, we have a cash up number that I'm going to read to um, people who are based um, in the US who are, maybe don't have chapters in their own local areas uh, that want to be part of the Boston chapter, even if you don't live in Massachusetts. Um, to um, either call in or be part of this Zoom um, or um, or at least um, send some donations to Kasha. We do have, the number is 857-719-4451. And now other people who have chap different chapters that are operating in the U.S. do not have to necessarily be part of this, but there are different states in the U.S. who do not have chapters established yet. And want to be part of this fundraising campaign. So I advise you to, to be part of this, be part of our destiny. Let's take our, uh, let's take back our country and, and be the deciders and determinants of what um, our future looks like. Thank you. Thank you so much for those points. Looks like we have, uh, we have lost our host temporarily, but uh, but I echo uh, the views uh, in the time being of uh, the rest of the comrades about the uh, the importance uh, of fundraising, especially when we witness what's happening on the ground uh, in Uganda at the moment. Uh, I think as uh, as most of you have noticed, we have seen uh, candidates from NRM party, they are going across the country with bags of 500 shilling coins, you can imagine. Others are walking around with stacks of 1,000 shillings and they're handing each voter 1,000 shillings, handing each voter 500 shillings. You can imagine that in the eyes of NRM, the value of a vote is 500 shillings or 1,000 shillings. That's, that's, how, that's how much they have valued voters in Uganda today. They go across the country. They make our brothers and sisters line up in single file. It's very demeaning. It's disappointing. And that's why most of us speak out, because... We believe as Ugandan, you should demand better from your leaders. You cannot have someone, members of parliament, go and represent you for five years and they come back in your constituency and they give you 1,000 shillings. 1,000, think about it. Like they have millions of shillings every month, but they come back, they don't, they are not fighting for your jobs. They are not fighting for a better economy. They are not fighting uh, for better services in the rural Uganda, but they are coming up and lining up our brothers and sisters, and giving them 1,000 shillings. So that's why we really need to get involved, fellow Ugandans. If you want to bring real change to Uganda, if you want what's happening right now to stop, where cash is handed out in exchange for votes, and the Electoral Commission is watching doing nothing. We have an NRM party which is giving out bicycles. All of what they are doing is violating the guidelines of the Electoral Commission, but the Electoral Commission is already compromised by NRM. They are letting all this bribery go by without any accountability. So we need to rise up as Ugandans. We need to get involved. Uh, right from the diaspora, we need to chip in because we are not on the ground like our foot soldiers who are really experiencing all the hardships that we talked about. We need to rise above these barriers we are experiencing. We talked about barriers in the media. Look at what's happening on social media. We have found a solution to solve a barrier created by NRM. They are denying opposition access to, to media outlets. But we have our social media. We can go on Good Friday, on Red Friday. We can, whenever Honorable Chagolin has his events, he goes live and people tune in. Mm -hmm. and so we can create solutions to overcome these barriers. But we need resources to be able to overcome these barriers. And one way is to support the initiative of Mudaku Muda. Let's all chip in. 10,000 shillings in Uganda, those who can. Uh, let's support Aisha Kabanda, who is the fundraising chair in Uganda, and those who are on the ground. And in the diaspora, we have our coordinators, as Comrade Agnes just talked about, the Boston people have their coordinator. Uh, here in DMV, we have ours, and other communities do have their coordinators. Buy your membership, contribute to the cause, support candidates, and continue speaking out about the injustices happening on the ground. The more we speak out, the more change is going to happen in Uganda. But it's not going to happen if we stay seated. We cannot let NRM go and buy votes 
for 1,000 shillings. Our voters deserve better. Our people deserve better. As people power, as NUP, we have to go to our voters and tell them that they have the ability to demand more from their government. The government cannot devalue our people for 34 years, that they are willing to throw them coins instead of better education, instead of better health care, instead of better job opportunities, where we have 1.5 million Ugandans fleeing the country to seek jobs elsewhere. Most of us would rather live in Uganda. I work in healthcare. I'd rather be working at Mulago right now, or I'd rather be working at a hospital in my village in Gomba instead of being here in the diaspora. But because our professionals lack opportunity, that's why many make the hard decision to go to the diaspora, and many in Uganda today lack the same opportunities. So we have to go to the mindset with the voters that we are not going to give them the fish which they can feed for on one day, but we are going to give them an occupation. We are giving to give them a net where they can fish for themselves for a lifetime. That's mm -hmm. the attitude and opposition we should have when we are campaigning, when we are convincing Ugandans that we have the better message, we have a better agenda, and we have a better approach that is going to fight for every Ugandan, irrespective of your tribe, irrespective of where you come from in Uganda. We want a Uganda which is diverse. Like my comrade Abili mentioned today, the 55th anniversary of uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. speech we, we have all heard of, uh, the I Have a Dream speech. So that spirit of activism is the same spirit we want to bring to Uganda. So that we don't judge our people because of their tribe. We don't judge them uh, because of their color or because of their re religion, but rather we judge them uh, by their content, by what they bring to the table. Uh, so we want every Ugandan to be involved. So again, I also echo my uh, co-panelist uh, message. Let's chip in, let's support each other. Let's pay for our membership because we are guaranteed to win in 2021. Thank you so much, moderator. And I apologize for cutting in when you, when you disappeared for a second. Thank you so much for rescuing me. I nearly got swallowed up. And speaking about the fundraising, that brings me to what the principal always says in vernacular, where he says, like he's saying, do what you can. People who are in the diaspora, you don't get affected by, you don't get hit up by the, the police. You don't get hit by the tear gas. We only watch this on our phones and, and, and television. So if you don't get affected by tear gas, nobody brutalizes you. The best you can do for this movement, the best you can do for this cause is to donate the little you have, is to donate the much that you have. We have no limit. You can give us million dollars. We want them. You can give us million pounds. We want them because we, we are being swallowed up by the regime. This is our last chance. This is our last chance to survive. We've seen people donate to, 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 to causes to global causes all over the planet. We also, when people donated to the Black Lives Matter, millions of dollars, because there is a, 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 a special cause that people want to rescue themselves from the doldrums of the regime. We as Ugandans are sitting on that hot plate. I don't even think whether it's still hot. I don't know whether it's extra hot or I don't know how to describe it, but this is our last chance. The people in Uganda, the, the, the Mudaku Muda, Muda Muda campaign, please support the cause. Please support the cause. We have a top leadership that is unemployed. The principal is unemployed. He's no long, he can no longer perform. The spokesperson is unemployed. The executive secretary is unemployed. We have thousands of kids that go to the ground campaigning for NUP and people. We have many people that are going to stand for so many legislative positions. All these need, people need to be funded because if we are to get rid of the dictator we have to come as a joint group ready to take on a dictator that has got billions of dollars there was a report uh, a few years ago where he was measured to be around seven billion dollars look at the person we are dealing with but we can do this because our cause is real and i ask all ugandans to donate to www.peoplepower.org.ug i ask all ugandans to donate to the uh, uh to, this, to the Daniel or your red number on mobile money that is everywhere on the principal's number, on, on the principal's page, on the People Power Media Center, on the Red Friday, and all over, all, all over Facebook. In South Africa, we are going to be launching our campaigns on the 6th 
of this month or of next month, which will be a Sunday. We are going to go and to go into a lot of fundraisings. There's a lot of groups that are doing this. We have groups like the people like the People Power Action Plan. We have groups in Cape Town, and there are so many groups in in the diaspora. I know groups in Canada, Boston, and so many uh, of groups of that kind. Let us donate to this cause. This is the best thing to do. I want to thank you all for having been with us today. Uh, comrade Ka Dan Dr. Daniel Kauma, Comrade Agnes, Comrade Edward Abidi, you look so smart with that very. Comrade JK, you were so calm, you were so eloquent, just like Dr. Kauma. I want to thank you all for sacrificing your time. Many of you don't, I always struggle to get hold of you. Some of you are hiding somewhere in your workplaces just to make this happen. I want to appreciate your efforts to see a better Uganda tomorrow. God bless you all. Thank you to all our listeners. We'll be back here. Same time, same place. God bless Uganda. I love you all. Thank you.